The creature from the Black Lagoon emerges. Good morning, bud. Let me get that for you. There you go. Morning, bud. It's going to be a crazy day today, Jaw, because I'm hopping on a bus and heading out of town tonight. So that means you're going to stay at a friend's house. Yep, slumber party for you, dude. It'll be fun for you, though. And me? Well, I'll be taking off on a trip to see something that I have wanted to see for years. So I know you'll be happy for me. Anyway, let me hop in the shower, make some coffee, and get this day rocking. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. That's the Seattle coffee dripping. Well, every once in a while, I'm flipping through the internet or I'm flipping through a book, and I read something that just... One sentence piques my interest, and I just go down the rabbit hole trying to investigate as much as I can about it, and today's is no exception. Today's is one of those ones that the simple sentence that I read, as soon as I read it, I'm like, I have to do a vlog on this. And the sentence was, the night Mabel Norman was hit in the head with a vase, and it changed her whole career. We're going to examine what happened, why it happened, and what the aftermath was of it. This thing is quite a story. And the reason that it was so hard to kind of pinpoint what happened was there were three different Gossam columnists in the 70s that wrote about this story. Now this story actually happens in 1915, but apparently in the 60s and 70s there was this era where kind of long forgotten people in the silent movie era were writing books and they had to make them salacious. And so um, what they kind of said was that this story was reported in three different uh, gossip columnist books and all three versions are completely different. Not completely different, but different enough to where it changes the story and it changes what happened. So I think I've uncovered what actually happened and I'm going to tell you about it when we get there. Now this happened at the Hillview Apartments. I've shown this to you before. I think it was during the, um, the Pretty Woman vlog. I think I walked by there and told you that Valentino had once owned it. After investigating some of the history, I'm not so sure that the... I did read that online that he did own it, and he very well may have for a year or two, but it seems like this place was built in 1913. The story we're going to talk about happened in 1915, and Valentino, he died in 1926, so I don't know. We'll, we'll discuss it as we go. But this was a building built by Jesse Lasky, a famous player. So you know how we went and did the whole DeMille Lasky barn? That Jesse Lasky. He actually had this apartment building built. Most everybody that lived there were silent movie actors, and Jesse Lasky for a time also lived there himself. So let's get our stuff together, let's rock, and I'm going to finish this coffee and get out of here and explore Mabel Norman, May Bush, and the Max Sennett story. Check out the clouds. Beautiful. I think I picked the perfect time to go do this vlog. No sun's out. Just a beautiful looking day to me. I love looking at the clouds looking like that. It looks like a painting, doesn't it? I feel like I'm at the Getty right now. Okay, so this Mabel Norman and Max Sennett story goes back a long way. This actually goes back to when she was 16 years old and they were both um, working in New York for D.W. Griffith. They were working on his movies and um, this I think this was actually in about 1908. And in 1910, Max Sennett found some people that were willing to invest in uh, Keystone Productions and send him out here to start making movies out here. And he actually did that, but he left Mabel there. And this kind of broke her heart. So he came out here and he started getting Keystone kind of set up, and then when he... Uh, Went back to New York the next time. She was still there. She was becoming more popular at the Vitagraph studio and he talked her into moving out here with him. So she moved out here in 1912 and immediately was in the first Keystone Productions movie, The Water Nymph. And um, she was slowly becoming a star. He was, she was kind of his prize. Um, he made it a, you know, of course he was attracted to her and he was interested in her. And she had a lot of guys at that studio that were interested in her because apparently Mabel was just so lovable. She would, when things weren't going well, she would be the person that cheered up the whole crew. 
she would cheer up everybody on the lot, including Mac, and people just loved her for that. She was like the ray of sunshine for the lot. And even Charlie Chaplin, when he started making movies with her at Keystone, he confessed his love to her and she just said she wasn't interested. So from the time 1912 to the time this story happens in 1915, Max Sennett and Mabel Norman were together. Uh, but they hadn't been married yet because at that time, it's pretty widely reported that if you were trying to become a star or you were a star, that if you were married, it really dimmed out the attraction for the fans. And so they always tried to hide it. Francis X. Bushman's book, I've read numerous places where he would get hundreds and hundreds of letters of fan mail every day. And they would always be women telling him how much they wanted to be his wife and everything. And he had seven kids already. <laughs> so basically, over this three year span, they had been going out. They were an, definitely an item. And I believe in 1912, Mae Bush comes to the lot. And Mae Bush was just another beautiful actress who was going to be working on the Keystone lot. And she immediately tried to become friends with Mabel Norman on the lot. Mabel kind of was apprehensive, but just realized, that oh, it's probably better to be friends with her than to not. So they ended up becoming friends. So when this story happens, it's kind of surprising. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the vlog, and it's a common occurrence with silent movie history in general, and it's one of the, one of the issues I always run into when doing silent movie vlogs, is that... There are so many varying sources that always have a different recollection of how things happened. So there's always an instance where I have to look at all these different stories and put together how it makes the most sense or what makes the most sense historically of everything that's said afterward and whatnot, what actually happened. So it's always, I'm always gonna get somebody that complains saying like, no, you got this wrong, you got this wrong. Well, it's just, it's hard to determine it. So I'm gonna give you a rundown of the different versions of this story that I had read, and then I'm gonna tell you what I think actually happened. Now, one of the first versions of the story was that Mabel Normand, on the eve of her wedding, catches uh, Max Sennett and May Bush having an affair. May Bush grabs a vase and smashes it over Mabel Norman's head, knocking her out. That was the first story that I'd heard. And the second story was a, um, was kind of a recollection in an interview by Minta Durfee, which was, uh, she was an actress at Keystone as well, but she was also Fatty Arbuckle's wife. And she recollected a story saying that she recalled the night that happened and said that her and Roscoe, Fatty, were sleeping out on the front porch of their house that evening and uh, heard a cab pull up and the cab driver was helping a blood-soaked from head to toe Mabel Norman out of the cab and that they said, even in the 70s, when this interview was given, of a story that happened in 1915, that Minta Durfee still had a huge grudge against May Bush. Now, one of the other things that's always kind of attested to this story is that because of the events of this, they say this is what got Mabel Norman hooked on drugs, made her a drug addict the rest of her life. Some of the re reports say that she never was a drug addict, so, that's the kind of stuff that you always have to weigh. And right here's where our story takes place. So basically what happened was Mabel Norman was called out of town for a few days in 1915 and uh, <laughs> she ended up coming back a day early. One of her friends told her if she showed up at this apartment building at a certain time at night she would find a very big surprise. So she came over here, went to the apartment, Push the door open. Found a naked May Bush standing inside the apartment and a naked Mac Senate laying in bed. May Bush completely startled. The story originally was reported that May Bush picked up a vase and smashed her over the head. Mac Senate freaked out, threw his clothes on, ran out of there. May Bush put her clothes on, took off in a cab, and left Mabel Norman there unconscious on the floor.
That was one account of what happened. Now that version of the story is also accompanied by this theory that Mabel Norman would then remain in that apartment for the next two weeks, stating uh, with a private doctor that she is called to the room, basically stating that she's on death's door and that she's getting worse by the day. Now that is three different versions of, this, of a story of the same event, and I don't believe any of them yet. So this is what I actually believe. The story that I believe is that Mabel Norman was told that something was going on over here. She did come over here. And the story that seems a little bit more believable that's reported is that she, um, she did open up the door, came in, found a naked May Bush and a naked Mac Senate, went ballistic and attacked May Bush first. And uh, May Bush was just stronger than her and actually uh, threw up against a wall and was, they said she was smashing her head up against like the side of the wall and where the window frame pane would start. And that's actually what caused the gashes in uh, Mabel Norm Norman's skull and some gashes down the side of her cheek. Now, uh, as she laid there bloody, May Bush did take off and what I believe happened kind of goes in with what Minta Durfee was saying. I think that um, Mabel came down here hailed a cab, went to Minta Durfee and Roscoe Arbuckle's house, and I believe that Minta Durfee helped her. Now, here's what the story, this is what the story turns into. So after this all happens, um, Mabel Norman reportedly has her private physician stay at her apartment and nurse her. Uh, meanwhile, every day Max Senat is calling, trying to find out how Mabel's doing and if he can see her. Every single day he's told no, he cannot see her and to go to hell from by the doctor. So um, after a week, what happens is, uh, after a week, all of a sudden in the newspaper, there's a report about Mabel Norman being on death's door and almost dying. And Max Sennett freaks out. He calls up some of his friends that were advertising in that newspaper and has them threaten to pull their advertisers unless there's a, uh, a printed retraction of some sort. So the newspaper does, pr um, they don't print a retraction, but what they do is they end up doing an update, well, kind of a retraction. They do an update um, in the middle of the paper on the smallest font you could possibly find saying that um, Mabel Norman was regaining her health and that she, she should be fine soon. Now, what ends up happening is after two weeks of Max Senate freaking out and calling and sending telegrams and trying to send his own doctors and everything being turned down, um, what ends up happening is he's summoned to the room at Mabel Norman's apartment. And what he's told by her quote unquote doctor, whose name uh, on the official registry is OM Justice. Now, one of the things that I found when I typed in OM was that that was kind of an old timey term for old man. So the name theoretically could have been old man justice. So what ends up happening is he's called out here and he's told he has an option. He has an ultimatum presented to him. And what is told to him by Mabel Norman is she says, you either build me my own studio. I also want the best directors. I want the most money spent. I want a perfect script that I'm happy with. I want you to publicize everything about it. I want no expense spared. And she also adds on like hundreds of other miniature requests and basically decides she's just gonna milk him to death and, um, and says that if he ever wants her in a movie of his again or ever wants to be romantic with her again, that he will have to abide by this. The alternative would be that if anything were to happen to her, if she died, he and May Bush would both be um, tried as murderers and their name would be splashed all over the news and they would never live it down. So he actually ends up agreeing to this. He gives her everything, he everything that she wants, builds her the Mabel Norman studio, of which he's never ever allowed to go. hires the best directors, gets the best script called Mickey. What she ends up doing is she also gets him to allow her to end up directing it eventually. 
and she ends up drawing out the process of finishing this movie for like over a year. So over this year, he's making money, but she's just taking every penny of it. And um, so what ends up happening is she makes up an excuse why she needs to go to New York City and she ends up staying in New York City until the movie comes out. And while she's there, she forces him to make ads and put promo ads everywhere. Like in storefront windows, it'll say Mickey is coming. Like soda shops, everything. Cigar stores, Mickey's coming, Mickey, Mickey, Mickey. So much so that when the movie actually came out, it was immediately a success. The song from the movie was one of the very first um, movie songs to become like a number one hit and she enjoys all this success, and as the movie starts um, becoming popular, making money and everything, she writes Max Sennett and tells him that she has signed with Goldwyn Studios for a salary, um, and that she owes everything that she is to Max Sennett, and without him, she would be nothing. She never um, was romantic with him again, ended up moving to New York for a while um, and it was basically you know she took the opportunity of catching him in this to basically turn herself into a star and uh, eventually she would be involved in many scandals many death scandals but this was pretty much the very first thing that she was kind of involved in and what a wacky story huh May Bush's um, reputation never really uh, survived it and she kind of was drugged through the mud for years because of this. You know, she was sleeping with a, uh, somebody who had a fiance, but at the same rate, Max Sennett was just, you know, they, there's also theories that that was not the only person that Max Sennett was uh, sleeping with. But in the end, she eventually did make three movies for Max Sennett years down the line kind of when her career was uh, in the decline, but they were never ever an item again, they never ever were romantic again, and she did eventually die at quite a young age, and um, among her pallbearers were Charlie Chaplin, Fatty Arbuckle, and Max Sennett, as well as um, Samuel Goldwyn. And to Max Sennett's testament, he did spend the rest of his life um, always trying to make Mabel Norman's name remembered in Hollywood. But this is the building where that infamous night happened. Isn't that crazy? And one of the reasons that I find that story to be the most accurate is because of all the stories that I read, every one of them, there, was, there were other factual things about the story that that weren't correct, that I was able to find where one story would say that the physician that treated her was um, somebody else, and I was able to find that she didn't start being treated by that woman until 1918, which would have been three years after this. And then one of the stories by someone else said that her brother was at her bedside, and her brother wasn't even in the state at the time, they said. So I really believe this version of the story, and, uh, and like I said, the fact that Minta Durfee in the 70s gave an interview and still had hatred for Mae Bush after all those years. Now here's one of the weird things, is that in 1932, was it 1932 or was it 1922? I forget, it was one of the two. I think it was actually 1922. Um, Mabel Norman had a birthday party and actually invited Mae Bush. So just to show you that it was all water under the bridge and probably in the end it was all for the best. Something just dawned on me and just out of curiosity I wanna look and see I just thought it would be kind of funny if one of those three people had a star right out in front of this building. So I figured I'd look before I take off. Nope, none of those three, but D.W. Griffith does. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out which apartment that that happened in. Because uh, I couldn't find a list of, I found a list of a bunch of silent movie actors that lived here, but I couldn't find the room numbers, but what a crazy story. As soon as I read that and just started tracking it back and I found out that this was the address and that it happened here, I knew the people that watched this, this vlog of mine, I knew that you guys would love this story and I hope you do. See that box swinging? 
right over top of where traffic's driving. That's the kind of stuff that kind of freaks me out a little bit. When I was taking that bus trip to San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, they had one of those hanging over the uh, freeway in San Francisco, and I was like, jeez. Now, like I said, a lot of the places that I read online, they all attributed this incident with why Mabel Norman became addicted to drugs, painkillers. Making the juice. I'm just on the cusp of hitting a thousand subscribers, which I'm totally excited about. However, I'm hoping to do it tomorrow. It would mean so much more if it happened tomorrow because of the vlog that I'm doing. Just kind of one of those serendipitous things that would mean a lot to me. So I, I need eight more subscribers. I'm hoping that doesn't happen today. I know that's such a stupid thing to say, but it's weird, but that's it's one of those weird things. I'm hoping that I hit 1,000 tomorrow. Anyway, um, I'm going to be meeting up with Vern Wood for the vlog tomorrow. And I noticed that Vern has been uh, bidding on my eBay boxes, my Mementos boxes. And he keeps getting out bids, so I'm going to put together like a little one for him. Uh, just kind of stuff around my apartment and kind of surprise him with it when I see him. Since he's nice enough, he volunteered months ago. If I ever wanted to do what I was going to do, he said he would drive me around. So so cool of him to offer to do that. So basically the general consensus seems to be that this doctor, this OM Justice, was actually Minta Durfee. And that she was the one that was that nursed uh, Mabel Norman back to health. And she was also the one that was helping her uh, make the demands and do all that stuff. I know it's kind of a convoluted story, or it's like kind of hard to follow in some parts, but I had to I had to study this one a few days before I completely understood everything. Long cut. That's impressive. All right, guys, say goodbye to Jaw going to drop him off now and then I'm heading out to uh well I'm hopping on a train and then I'm hopping on a bus well boy do I have a predicament I just dropped jaw off it's 8 30 at night my bus is supposed to leave at 11 30 which means I have to pretty much hop on the train by about 10 30 to be safe and I just got an audition ticket telling me that I have a call back for that Popeye's audition tomorrow so they just let me know just now. So uh, I don't know what to do. I emailed my agent and hopefully they get back to me. Tell me, I, I ask if there's a way that I can audition and do it on Friday instead or self tape it or something. Hopefully I can because I would hate to cancel going on this trip because of a 10 minute audition. But then again, it could be between me and one other person and you know, I hate to gamble, and Murphy's Law, I hate to gamble against myself, but haven't had much of, hardly any auditions all year, and then the one time that I do, the callback is on a day that I had already planned on taking a trip, so, I don't know what's going to happen, I'll keep you guys posted. Well, I heard back from my agent, and they said that they won't have an answer from the casting directors until the morning, so... For the betterment of my career, and so that someday I can afford a real harmonica instead of the one on my necklace. I think I should probably stay in town tonight, not go on my trip, cancel my tickets, and uh, go on my call back tomorrow and hope that I get this uh, commercial. I could really use it. So, uh... Keep your fingers crossed for me, guys. Hopefully that's like one of those things. It's like things are meant to happen when they're meant to happen. Maybe the whole reason that I have to miss this trip is so I can book this commercial, right? Hope so.